This video is freeware, so you can use it as you wish. Gaddafi arrested. Yahoo! Conduct operations. For example, when Israel is doing its counter-crossing operation and starting to become successful, and the United States comes out and supports Israel with the promise of more military aid, that's when the Arabs start to increase the price of oil. Then they put an oil embargo on the United States. It puts pressure on the United States to get more involved diplomatically. It puts pressure then on people who are conducting battles on the Israeli side to end the war as quickly as possible because it imposed ceasefires coming down quickly. For the Egyptians, they're just trying to hold on with what they have because Sadat sees that there might be a political resolution in it. So you find that in the conduct of war, not only what you do tactically affects the political, but also you might find that political then makes decisions and starts using other kinds of weapons like the economic weapon of oil that influences your own operations and you never can see yourself in isolation. And this war brings this dynamic very beautifully together because it's there in the planning by Sadat going into the war, talking to Arabs about using the oil weapon in the war. It's done in the war by the use of the weapon, and then afterwards, it's part of the pressure to bring some resolution to this conflict to get the oil embargo rescinded, to bring back the free flow of oil. Because the Western world is much more vulnerable than we are in the United States, but we have to show leadership to help the rest of the Western world to handle the economic problem of rising oil prices. Um, that's a very good point. I'd, I'd also like to reinforce Colonel Kretschik's point, uh, particularly in bringing forward things that we've looked at in previous lessons. In this instance, the ideas of Karl von Clausewitz, um, which, which I think is a very, excellent, excellent, excellent. Um, very good idea. Now, in terms of the conduct of, of the war, there are some broader issues, too, that you might consider. How important is it that you start the war and have the initiative at the beginning? Does it create more fog and friction for an army that is stronger, more superior when it comes to military skills? And in the LP, you find that it, there is a flow of events trying to capture the kinds of tactical and operational dilemmas that confront Israelis as they find themselves having to prepare counterattacks, not knowing how well the enemy is prepared, making certain assumptions about the enemy. You might ask your students, too, the question, what kind of problems would we have if we found ourselves having to go into an area where we're fighting for control of the air and the ground at the same time, and the other opponent has started the war. What kinds of adjustments would we have to have in our military, the way we've prepared ourselves mentally, doctrinally, technologically, to fight that kind of conflict? Because there are some parallels. We're used to, like the Israelis, fighting with air superiority, being on the offensive, not letting having the other guy have the initiative. That's very true, George. Uh, we are so used to being, uh, if you will, the top dog uh, in uh, military affairs uh, that we forget that their people can use uh, not just initiative, uh, but uh, different ways of, of attacking the same problem uh, that we are not going to expect. We do not have the answer to everything. And uh, even though uh, our present enemies might be less technologically capable than we are, uh, they may be able to use that particular idea against us because we are so technologically advanced. I would like to bring out uh, one additional point to reinforce uh, this conversation, and that comes from a planner's perspective. Uh, many of your officers have planned or executed military operations in the past, but possibly only at the tactical level. And I'd like to just discuss something here at the operational strategic level that may be important. As a, as a plans officer myself, one of the things I had to envision when looking at the enemy was I would, I would go back to Sun Tzu, and I would think about knowing yourself and knowing your enemy, you need not fear a, fear a thousand battles. But one of the things that I tried to do from the enemy's perspective was I had to try to war game in my mind operationally how an enemy force would react to something we were doing. And then once I envisioned that reaction, 
uh, how it would counteract what the enemy was doing. I think we see some of that uh, reflected in the Egyptians' preparation for this war. Well, the Israelis themselves are really not going through this dynamic uh, between the period of 67 and 73. To tie back to what happens when you miscalculate, however, uh, I think the Egyptians also have certain assumptions about the Israeli army knowing their enemy and how fast that army can mobilize. One of the things is that the Israeli army nature is it, it depends greatly upon reservists uh, and trying to call up from the populace a force that can then eject any type of force which threatens the mother country. If you go back to other previous lessons such as World War I, uh, a, essentially a war of plans, a war of mobilizations, uh, the Germans had certain preconceived notions on how fast Russia uh, could get its act together and mobilize its force, and when Russia was able to do that two weeks faster than envisioned. What did that do then to the whole plan for conducting that operation? This is something that your students need to be aware of because if they tie into other instruction and tactics, such as branches and sequels to plans, you must have have some type of idea that if your basic assumptions of how fast your enemy can react prove to be wrong, then what options do you have in order to still achieve the national objectives? Because if you don't have those options laid out ahead of time, it's simply too late once the, me the mechanisms begin to conduct this war to then react. And I think that then you put both the leadership, military leadership, and the political leadership in a position uh, that they don't want to be put in, which is running out of options quickly. So I would sort of challenge your students to draw upon their own personal experience, both in planning and, and operating, and ask them what happens uh, to the Egyptians and the Israelis as this war begins to unfold about their preconceived notions about how each side is going to act or not act, and then what do they do to try to counter things when reality begins to set in, and it is not just an assumption, but they're now faced with life and death situations on the battlefield, and what changes do they have to make in order to adapt to that situation? Aha, the difference between real war and war on paper. That's it. Hospitals. Yeah. Another thing that you might consider, too, as you look at this war is the whole issue of fatigue. Uh, we often don't talk about that in our military history course, but look at the 8th of October problems that the Israelis have in understanding what really is the plan, what really transpired at that meeting on the 7th of October when everybody was tired under stress. Remember, we're talking about officers who have seen, in most cases, at the senior level, this is their third or fourth war that they've been in, so they're not without combat experience. This is not the first shots that they have seen, but yet they are tired. They are cranky. They are having a hard time remembering what was actually said to each other. They are having to react with little time to think because things are happening fast on the battlefield. Would digitization solve their problems? Or could the opponent find counters to that digitalization to still bring confusion to the battlefield? Try to capture that face of battle because that's the reality for these people in tactical units. They're going to have to face death and destruction, and it brings with it a whole set of problems. And there's no easy solution as you look at each of these battles, 8th of October, a Chinese farm. There are a lot of tough decisions that have to be made, and there are probably no right or wrongs, and some are better than others. May I interject a point sure. here? Regarding your specific point. It would be possible to ask one student to read the one chapter in Martin Van Crefeld's book, Command in War, which would also introduce the notion of political interference and a politicized military also into the, both the realm of strategic and operational planning. Uh, don't have all the class read that chapter, but just have one student read that chapter and brief the others on it. Uh, just to, to add more depth and uh, to make it for a, a richer lesson? Sure. Yeah. Sure. George, may I add some here also? Sure. Um, there are two other books which are readily available in, in libraries, which I would recommend if you want to get into some of the strategic dynamics. One book is The Causes of War, 
uh, by Blaney, uh, where he gets into the whole notion of perception and misperception about forces and why nation states go to war against other nation states. Uh, another book is by a, a team, Cohen and Gooch, called Military Misfortunes, which talk about where disasters occur in military operations. A student who wants to do additional depth of reading uh, and may bring in a different perspective into this lesson can go to both of those books and easily find something which would be of use to the group. I think it's about time to move to the, the last part, which is the results of this war. What impact does it have? One issue that you can ask, and it's an important issue because it affects your analysis of what Sadat, Assad, and Meir are all about, is what impact does this war have on the participants, in particular on Israel and on the United States? Are Sadat's strategic objectives met in this regard. What did he want to achieve in this war vis-a-vis the United States, vis-a-vis Israel? Again, who won the war? Who won the war? (laughs) That's one thing that you might look at. That's at the strategic level. But at the same time, the thing that's interesting is you might consider, and this is kind of makes you want to pause and think about warfare, is how long it takes to get to Camp David and then the peace treaty. And in a way, the Israelis use an attrition diplomacy, wearing down some of the effects of the war that are negative to them. So there they come out with something that Sadat did not really originally want, is a separate peace treaty with Israel. But he gets maneuvered into it. So war, the way it ends, does not necessarily logically lead to what you might think are the most logical results politically. But now the politicians are left to negotiate to make time uh, work to their benefit. And in there, the United States gets involved, Israel is involved, uh, Egypt is involved, and the rest of the Arab world is involved. Was Moltke correct? His strategy, nothing more than a series of stop gaps. Exactly. A legitimate question. Exactly, exactly. Another thing that you might look at is the impact then that the war has on the United States and the evolution of warfare. Uh, we do have the LP with that reading. A student can look at that and, and summarize some of that impact. It has a tremendous impact on the United States. It is considered in the evolution of warfare probably the beginnings of precision-guided missiles in warfare. It is the use of electronic warfare in a conventional sense with large forces. It is using tanks in large numbers, numbers that probably equal those in the Battle of Kursk in World War II. Not that they're all fighting at the same time, but they're spread out over a couple fronts. So we're talking about death and destruction and loss of equipment that boggles the mind in the United States because it's a high level so that we have to train virtually a lot of our storage capabilities in NATO to resupply Israel. And we don't want to see that happening. So it isn't a war that has an impact tremendously on the societies involved, which is one thing that's very important. The other factor to consider is what impact does it have on the evolution of warfare on the U.S. in particular. This um, this war comes as a rude shock for everyone. It's the first real opportunity since 1945 to see large conventional militaries engaged in combat and see what happens. Next, In next week's lesson, we're going to see how the U.S. Army relates to this very rude shock, coupled with um, leaving the Repo- uh, South Vietnam. Another question can be asked was raised by the first of the great scientific uh, historians, Hans Delbruck, a hundred years ago. <clears throat> Before the invention of the tank and the airplane, looking at military history, he said, the central question is who rules the battlefield? The man on horseback or the man on foot? And he meant it, literally. But in 1973, clearly, the man on horseback is, has been replaced symbolically by the man in the tank and the man in the helicopter or aircraft. Who rules the battlefield in 1973? Who rules it now? What should we be doing now to prepare ourselves and the next generation of officers for dealing with profound change? 
one of the lessons you might consider in that is uh, the prophets right after, some were saying the airplane is dead because of the air defense system. It won't play that role again. The anti-tank missile will challenge the armor to the point it will be taken off the battlefield. One lesson that comes out of this is for every weapon there's a counter weapon and it's the combining of these arms in the right kind of organization to get the maximum effect. See perhaps also Info evidence 24th April 2005 After the first and the second contact See impossible these videos Only 22 days passed And then 